Now, I want you to know that it really does give me a great deal of pleasure to introduce our speaker for this 76th annual opening convocation. Mr. Frederick M. Lawrence is the 10th Secretary and Chief Executive Officer of Phi Beta Kappa, the nation's first and most prestigious honor society, which was founded in 1776. And since I believe in truth, since I believe in full disclosure, I have talked to him about trying to get a Phi Beta Kappa chapter here at Hampton. And I wanted him to come down to see us, to meet some of you students, back, to kick the tire, to be able to wander around this wonderful home by the sea that I call one of God's little acres to see the prettiest campus in the whole wide world, okay? So aside from his many accomplishments, and one that can officially get us started for this year, I had something else in mind as well. I want him to work with us and for us, and the little that I know about him and what Dr. Kowalski and others have told me about him, when he gives his word, he's going to do it. He's told me he's going to work with us. Because I think that if there's any school in the nation that deserves a Phi Beta Kappa chapter, it's Hampton. Secretary Lawrence is a distinguished lecturer at Georgetown Law Center and has previously served president of Brandeis University, dean of the George Washington School of Law, visiting professor and senior research scholar at Yale Law School. He's been elected to the American Philosophical Society and the American Law Institute. And on a very well-known, distinguished scholar, teacher, and attorney. Secretary Lawrence is one of the nation's leading experts on civil rights, free expression, and biased crime. He has published widely and lectured internationally. Author of Punishing Hate, Biased Crimes Under American Law, Secretary Lawrence is an opinion contributor to the publication The Hill and U.S. News, and frequently contributes op-eds to various other news sources, such as Boston Post, Newsweek, Observer, the New York Daily News, and the Huffington Post. At Phi Beta Cap, Secretary Lawrence has focused on advocacy for the arts, humanities, and science, championing free expression, free in academic freedom, and invigorating the society's 286 chapters and 50 alumni associates. As president of Brandon, Secretary Lawrence's accomplishments, including restoring fiscal stability to the university, and overseeing record-setting increases in admissions applications, undergraduate financial aid, and the university's endowments. His legal career was distinguished by service as an assistant U.S. attorney for the Southern District of New York in the 1980s, where he became chief of the Civil Rights Division. Secretary Lawrence earned the bachelor's degree from Williams where he was elected by Beta and a Juris Doctor from Yale Law School, where he served as one of the editors of the Yale Law Journal. Ladies and gentlemen, it really is a me to ask you to join me in welcoming the 2018 opening convocation speaker, a very distinguished scholar and man 
Secretary and CEO, Frederick Gilm Lawrence. Thank you, Dr. Harvey, for that very warm introduction and for uh, putting me on the spot about a Phi Beta Kappa chapter. Ladies and gentlemen, your, uh, your president, as we say in Washington, D.C., knows how to stay on message. It is a tremendous honor for me to be asked to be with you today at Hampton on the occasion of your 76th annual opening convocation of this great story. University. We open to the inspiring words of the 24th Psalm, but I wonder whether I was the only one who, on the way in here this morning, processing through, was reminded of a, another Psalm where the psalmist says, This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. I do think, I do think it was precisely such a day as this that the psalmist had in mind. And I understand that it never rains on a Hampton convocation. And I think that's because Dr. Harvey wouldn't let it happen. And so, so I figure if he's got the good Lord on retainer, who am I to say no? It is also a particular pleasure for me to be part of a great celebration with my dear friend and your fellow Hamptonian, Freeman Herbowski, and his wonderful wife, Jackie, for their great support for this institution, as I suspect most, maybe all of you know, but you may not know, uh, that he is among all of us who've had the privilege of being university presidents, considered uh, our colleague, our leader, our teacher. Uh, Freeman, you've been an inspiration for what you have accomplished and have raised the bar high for all of us. So. You have set the bar high as well for your fellow Hamptonians, and it's a particular pleasure for me to be here for your celebration as well. And of course, particularly for the, what is it, the hottest class? Yeah. Class of 2019. You know, it's on occasions like this for and for all of the undergraduates here, those, uh, those about to graduate and those aspiring to graduate down the road. It's on occasions like this that people like me are supposed to stand in front of you and say, these four years are the best four years of your life. I never say that. I can't imagine anything more depressing than saying to a group of young people that when you graduate, you'll look back and say, the best years of my life are behind me. My wish for you, my blessing for you is that for the rest of your long, fulfilling lives, you will always say the best four years of your life are the one you are living and the three that are about to come. But these years at Hampton are special ones. And even as the journey takes you far from here geographically, I say with some confidence it will never take you far from here philosophically, spiritually, intellectually. You see, places don't belong to us. We belong to places. And this is a place with a deep mission that speaks to all of us, and I think especially to you. What a, what a remarkable, remarkable moment in the early, still inspiring days of the first Reconstruction 150 years ago this spring, if I have my Hampton history right, to open an institution committed to learning by doing and education for life. Students who should be young men and women who should go out and teach and lead their people for the sake not only of safe support, self-support and intellectual labor, but also for the sake of character. A word so overused and underappreciated in our time. An institution that would train the head, the hand, and the heart of Hampton students. This was a visionary mission to transform and heal a world so desperately in need of repair. It is both timeless and timely. It inspires us still. 
So for the undergraduates here, <clears throat> whether you have just this year left or a little bit longer, I know that one of the things you think about and your faculty think about as well is how can you make the most of your time here? And I don't just mean the courses that you take, although of course I mean that too, but I, but I mean something deeper. You know the expression that your education consists of everything you take from your schooling after you forget all the stuff they taught you. You know who said that? That was Albert Einstein. So that's the kind of deeper level of learning I'm talking about. And I have two aspects in mind. Learning how to learn and learning how to advocate. Let me start with a little bit about learning how to learn. It is in fact the essence of a liberal arts and sciences education. Whatever your chosen field, you will have to adapt to change over time, sometimes change at a breathtaking pace. Indeed, the pace of change itself is accelerated. It's what our math colleagues would call a second derivative problem. And there are about 12 of you who got that. So look at one of the people who's laughing and ask him why he's laughing and he'll explain it to you. The particular information, you can stop me when you don't get it, okay. The particular information that you learn will become obsolete more quickly than you can possibly imagine. But learning how to learn will always be relevant. That's why, paradoxically, liberal arts may turn out to be the most practical education there is for a rapidly changing world. <laughs> Who amongst us would possibly begin to say what the workplace will require of you in 20 or 30 years? I'll take a stab at it. It will require you to question, to analyze, to problem solve, to think creatively, to turn raw information into knowledge, and to seek at the highest aspiration to turn that knowledge into wisdom. Those are skills that I am quite confident, just as they were relevant to the founders of Phi Beta Kappa on the cold winter night of December 5th, 1776, not that far from here, in the Apollo Room of the Raleigh Tavern in Williamsburg, Virginia, where five undergraduates gathered to found the Phi Beta Kappa Society dedicated to an extraordinary notion that, well, Phi Beta Kappa in Greek is philosophia bio kubernetes. That means love of learning is the guide of life. I like to say actually the pilot of life, the helmsman of life, works in this gorgeous location. Because you see, the guide takes you on a path that already exists. Helmsman steers you out into the water where there is no path. My friends, sometimes the waters are choppy the times we're living in. They were choppy in 1776, and they dedicated themselves then to an extraordinary notion. Not the monarchy, not inheritance, not wealth, but the love of learning would be the helmsman of life. So how do you operationalize that in your life here at Hampton? I would encourage you to look for opportunities to cross-train your brain. If you're interested in science and engineering, medicine, nursing, consider using your elective slots to take more rigorous courses in psychology, sociology, philosophy, history, creative writing. It will help you better understand the users of technology or your future patients. In fact, May surprise you, but 80% of Nobel Prize laureates in the sciences point to specific ways in which it is the arts that boosted their innovative abilities. Likewise, those of you studying the arts, humanities, education, and other liberal arts students, you learn to effectively marshal data and figures that will make you more creative entrepreneurs and better leaders. Speaking of leaders, that second thing to learn, besides learning how to learn, is learning how to advocate. And let's be honest with each other, these are no ordinary times in which to be an advocate. We see around us every day, we live in a time of extreme political and social polarization, declining trust in American civic institutions, including higher education itself, and deep divisions over free expression and inclusion. 
to become the advocates that the world needs, I encourage you right now to embrace free speech and expression and diversity of thought on campus and beyond. Advocacy for your position should not require silencing that of another. Even in the context of hate speech, and I know from whence I speak, both as a victim of and as an advocate in the area of bias-motivated violence, and Congressman Scott knows what I'm talking about, I had the honor of testifying before him. First time I testified before what was then called the Hate Crimes Prevention Act was in 1994, and we figured out about every possible way there was to lose. We had the House and the Senate, but not the President. We had the President in the House, and we couldn't get the Senate then. And then in 2009, I do believe my eyes were not the only ones that were moist when President Obama signed the Matthew Shepard and James Byrd Hate Crimes Prevention Act of 2009. But even in the context of hate speech, the answer, as former U.S. Supreme Court Justice Louis Brandeis famously taught, is not enforced silence, it is more speech. Robust freedom of expression is essential for a first-rate education, just as it is essential for a self-governing democracy. But make no mistake about it, words can be hurt and words can be harmful. Free speech exacts a cost on society. Now, although I believe it is a cost overall that is worth bearing, we must never forget that this is not a cost that is spread equally across all members of society. Some members of the community bear more than their fair share of the cost of free expression. Now, this recognition of unequal harm distribution creates imperatives for all of us. For those of us in positions of responsibility and leadership, it is essential that hate speech, though not be repressed, be labeled for what it is and denounced. Brandeis's call for more speech is not merely an option today. I believe it is a moral obligation for all members of academic communities, all of us in this hall. Silence is not an option. Bishop Desmond Tutu said that if you are neutral in situations of injustice, you have chosen the side of the oppressor. Understand that when you resist and reject hate speech, some will call you snowflakes. But I see no snowflakes in this hall. I see only advocates, and I see the future. Great advocates are not only intelligent, they are savvy. How does one confront a view that denies the very idea of diversity and societal inclusion? I'll share with you the advice I gave a group of students who posed exactly this question to me on another campus I visited last year. I said the speaker who was about to come to their campus was wrong about virtually every single issue except for one, and that was his right to speak. He said, you have the opportunity to frame the discussion. Why frame the debate around the single issue on which he is right? Instead, frame it around all the issues on which he is terribly, seriously, and fundamentally wrong. Insist on the right to ask questions and prepare, prepare, prepare. Rather than seeking to silence the speaker, demolish his arguments. In addition, by all means, demonstrate and protest. Don't disrupt, don't seek to silence, but manifest your views through forceful, peaceful protest. And finally, don't ignore the powerful role of humor. You know, when white supremacist Richard Spencer spoke at University of Florida, one of the biggest pubs in Gainesville put out an announcement that anybody who showed up with two unused tickets to the Spencer event got a pitcher of beer. Turns out there's a constitutional right to speak, but there's no constitutional right to have anybody show up to listen to you. Like the world in which Hampton was founded a century and a half ago, we find ourselves in a time of a society and a world in desperate need of repair. But these challenges predate the founding of this university, and they go back to the very founding of the nation. 
You know, Dr. King had a famous expression he used for the guarantees in the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence and the Bill of Rights. He said it was like a promissory note, a bill to be paid, and that his generation was now at long last going to present that bill for payment. Dr. King knew that the promissory note had not been paid in full in 1776 when the Declaration of Independence was drafted, nor had it been paid in full in 1788 when the Constitution was ratified. He knew that promissory note had not been paid in full in the late 1860s and early 1870s during the first reconstruction in the aftermath of the Civil War. And he even knew that the promissory note would not be paid in full in the second reconstruction during the 1960s, a period of great but incomplete social progress for which he ultimately gave his life. And we all know that that promissory note has not been paid in full between 2009 and 2016. So who would have guessed that it now falls to you, the young men and women of Hampton University, to see to it that that promissory note is yet again presented for payment and that the guarantees and promises set forth in our founding documents and expanded upon over the centuries might yet be realized? If this task seems too great to you, and if you think too much is being asked of you, then I would remind you that the tools necessary for this work are precisely what you have been obtaining here at Hampton. I would also share with you the great teaching from my tradition that you are not obligated to finish the work, nor are you free to desist from it. Your task is not to perfect the world, but it is most decidedly to leave it better than you found it. I know I speak for Dr. Harvey, Dr. Hrabowski, your faculty members, all members of the Hampton family, when I say, perhaps we love you too much. Perhaps we expect too much of you, but we do, and you better not let us down. Good luck to you all, and God bless you all. <laughs>